Today I'd like to address something that Tavis Smiley said on CBS News Sunday morning last weekend. Poverty is the new slavery. Okay, well that's certainly something. Uh, to understand what he meant by that, you pretty much have to watch the whole... Just roll the tape. Throughout American history, there have been proud moments of revolution that forced the elite to remove their blinders of greed, tyranny, and domination. America has, of course, made great strides for freedom in regard to all of its citizens, but now America has regressed, and poverty is the new slavery. The blinders are once again firmly affixed, and the necessary checks and balances have disappeared, making way for policies that coddle the wealthy, while the persistent poor, the working poor, and the new poor are ignored and rendered invisible. Okay, so if I'm understanding Tavis Smiley correctly, then poverty in America exists, or at least continues to exist, because the elites have their blinders of greed, tyranny, and domination firmly affixed and those blinders have been removed by what he doesn't say, nor does he say what these policies are in place that we have right now that he thinks coddle the wealthy and he's checks and balances in there, making it sound like checks and balances are gone. What could that mean? What checks and balances? And also that thing about while the persistent poor, the working poor, and the new poor are ignored and rendered invisible. Yeah. He said that the poor have been rendered invisible, and we're ignoring them. Now, whatever the plight of the poor in this country, certainly don't think that we're ignoring them. That's not to say a lot of people wouldn't like to ignore the poor, or try not to think about the fact that they're unfortunate people in this country who can't afford the basic necessities of life. But I certainly don't think we're ignoring them. Tavis goes on to say, The fact that 1% of the nation's richest individuals control 42% of the nation's wealth is to me a stunning revelation in the wake of a recession. The 400 richest people in America, according to Forbes, have more than a trillion dollars of wealth. They each average three and a half billion dollars of net worth. And no, this is not the politics of envy, but rather a cautionary tale about what happens to a country that drifts so far away from any notion of fundamental fairness for its citizens that we end up a nation of the rich and the rest of us. Okay, uh, took a lot away from that. Let's start with the simple things. Seems to me that as long as we have rich people in America, then we are always going to be a nation of the rich and the rest of us. If you draw a line, as Tavis Smiley implicitly does in that opinion piece, saying that, you know, on this side of the line are rich people, and if you have less than a certain amount of money, then you're not rich, then of course you're going to be a nation of the rich and the rest of us. That's not, there's not something inherently wrong. Also, he seemed to be thinking that this was going to be dismissed as the politics of envy, that certainly wasn't the impression I got. He didn't seem to be sounding an envious tone, but let's talk about that Forbes 400 list. It's interesting to me, I took a look at the latest Forbes 400 list, and you know who's on that list? Some interesting people. There's Lawrence Ellison, the Oracle guy, he's number three on the list. His net worth is estimated somewhere between 33 and 36 billion dollars. And according to this book, Ellison was born in the Bronx. His 19-year-old mother, who was unmarried at the time, decided she couldn't afford to raise him, so she gave him to her sister and brother-in-law to raise. Ellison grew up in an apartment in Chicago's South Shore. Not poor enough for you? Fine. Take a look at David Geffen. With a net worth of $5.5 billion, Geffen comes in at number 58 on the list. He's, Smiley should like him because he's a Democrat. He made his money in the entertainment industry, but more importantly, he 
grew up in a one-bedroom apartment in Brooklyn, and then he became a famous Hollywood mogul guy, record producer, whatever. Let's see some more. Look at this man. Number 36 on the list, Harold Hamm. Forbes puts his net worth at $11 billion as of March 2012. He was born the youngest of 13 children in post-Dust Bowl, Oklahoma. You think your life sucks. Well, maybe it does. But this man was the son of a sharecropper. Now he's worth $11 billion. Leon Charney. He's a ways down on the list, number 331, but he has a great life story. He was the son of immigrants. His father, a sewing supply salesman, died when he was a boy. He worked his way through college and law school, at times literally singing for his supper. Now he's worth over a billion dollars. He has his own cable TV show. If you're not familiar with David Murdoch, then perhaps you're familiar with one of the companies he founded. This one in particular. Murdoch used to be homeless. Now he's number 139 on the Forbes 400 list. Let me ask you something. Have you ever used a Paul Mitchell product on your hair or drank Patron vodka or any Patron spirit? Well... If so, then you've probably been of help to this man in amassing his great fortune. John Paul DeJoria, he's tied for number 81 on the list with David Green. He's another son of immigrants. At one time, this man was living out of his car. In his younger days, he spent time in foster care, got involved with street gangs, and now he's worth roughly $4 billion. You know, all these stories are great and interesting and encouraging to anyone who's fallen on hard times, or should be, but I can't help but feel like we're forgetting someone. A classic rags-to-riches story. Someone who just about everybody in the United States would know. A household name, if you will. Oh, yeah! Number 139 on the list, Oprah... Winfrey. For those of you who weren't aware, Oprah was born into abject poverty in rural Mississippi. Today she's worth billions of dollars, and despite the ill-conceived OWN weighing her down, she still has commanded the respect and attention of millions of women across the country. I think we're spending too much time on this Forbes 400 list. Let's listen to the rest of what Tavis Smiley had to say. Poverty threatens our democracy, a democracy with a deficit dilemma that the poor are not responsible for, yet they pay the price. Whoa, 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 hold it right there, Smiley. If you're talking about the budget deficit, then I disagree that they are not responsible for that, and certainly I disagree that they're the ones paying the price. Well, actually, I don't disagree with that. We are all paying the price for the budget deficit. Anyone who currently pays taxes or will pay taxes in the future is paying the price for the budget deficit because of our skyrocketing national debt. However, I'm not sure that he's talking about the budget deficit, but uh, let's move on. There are nearly 150 million poor and near poor people in America who are not responsible for the damage done by the Great Recession. Wow, 150 million poor? That, that, wait a minute, 150 million people? That's nearly half the country. And you're saying these people are not only poor, but they're not responsible for the damage done by the Great Recession? First of all, what caused this Great Recession? At its core, the credit crunch, the mortgage meltdown, the financial crisis, whatever you want to call it, at its core... The cause of this was irresponsible behavior by a lot of people. But certainly, some of those people were people who are now poor. I guess what he called the new poor. And people who lied on their mortgage applications to take out loans that they couldn't afford, they took on debt they couldn't afford, 
to buy homes they couldn't afford or to improve on homes that they couldn't afford or to they took out additional mortgages to pay for stuff they wanted and certainly i think you can't absolve them of all responsibility yes there's plenty of blame to go around but let's not pretend that these millions of poor people are not responsible for the damage done by the great recession at all also you see here where he cites to the annie e casey foundation I went to their website. I couldn't find this report or where he was getting this data from. I couldn't find anything with this 150 million number. In any ways, let's finish out the segment. I'm getting tired. Nearly one third of the American middle class, mostly families with children, have now fallen into poverty. The magnitude of the Great Recession confirms that poverty is no longer a personal calamity. It is, rather, a societal crisis. The time is now to once again reawaken American democracy. It's time for a righteous indignation against the fleecing of America's poor, given the indifference toward the poor that has infected our social, political, and economic discourse. In short, it's time to make poverty a priority. Where there is no hope for the future, there is no power in the present. Who is fleecing the poor? Except for other poor. I remember when we were in college and we did this thing. We lived on the streets for a weekend to see what it was like to be homeless. It was part of... I, I don't remember. Anyway, I learned that a lot of homeless people steal from other homeless people. But that being aside, somehow I, I don't think that's what he was referring to when he talked about fleecing the poor. Look, we're a very generous country. And, all right, here's the deal. I have more to say on this. I think I should blog about it. I just saw this thing, and it really provoked me. But anyway, I think that this calls for a more in-depth analysis that would be better suited to a post on my blog. But I didn't do that because, well, I had other things to do that were more important. I may do a blog post like that eventually, but the past couple weeks have been so busy for me that it took me almost two whole weeks just to make this video. So it'll be a while before I get around to that. There are other posts on my blog, which I encourage you to go to. There is the address. There is also a link to my blog in the description page on this video page. And Mitt Romney picked Paul Ryan as his running mate. So we're probably going to have to do a video about that. But in case I don't get around to it this weekend, then I just want to suggest something watch the rachel maddow show on monday night and just count how many times she repeats the words kill medicare in the program now i cannot emphasize this enough please do not turn this into a drinking game because you will get hurt or you'll hurt someone you love or don't love but you know you may end up hurting someone, or at least damaging something, because you're going to get really stinking drunk. Uh, anyway, that's it. Let's go back to the original video. Also, please follow me on Twitter, at RightWingGenius. Thank you for watching, and as always, don't mess with the right-wing genius.